Our text is simply this. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, as easy as it is sometimes just to, just to skim over things, I can't do that here because in this world today, growing up, I was born in 1981. That is the year when there were more divorces in the United States than any other year. Divorce actually peaked in 1981. It's been going down, not because marriages are lasting longer, although they're maybe lasting a little longer, mostly because less people are getting married. They're just cohabitating longer, and so you just get less divorces that way. Second, divorce. And I think precisely, I grew up in 1981, and there were a lot of political debates surrounding divorce, and it created a lot of tension, which created an air of harshness in how the church addressed divorce and treated divorce, which I think is profoundly unhelpful, especially as we turn to the Bible. Jesus will lighten your burden if you bring it to him. And if you're walking into the church today with a lot of shame from things done in the past, in Jesus Christ, there is relief from shame. And we're going to see that here. So, in this text, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Adultery obviously being a, a sin. It's in the Ten Commandments. Pretty big one there, written on the rock. You don't write things on big rocks for nothing. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So what we have to do here is we're going to look into Matthew's gospel because Matthew's gospel has a much fuller picture of divorce. And then we're going to go back and look at Luke. So Matthew, Matthew 19, verse 3. If you got your Bibles, you can flip over to there. Matthew 19, starting verse 3. Our Sunday school kids, we were practicing looking up Bible verses today, which was really fun. Like New Testament, go about two-thirds of the way through, find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then find Acts which has nothing to do with chopping down trees, which I was very disappointed. When I was like an eight-year-old boy, like, I was like, Axe has nothing to do with axes. Like, this is false advertising. Anyways. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, there's a very specific question because there were different parties who had different ideas about divorce some of them said, you know, if your wife burnt the toast, that was legitimate grounds for divorce. You could just write it, put it in her hand, and send her off. Others had a little bit more restrictive views. And Jesus is going to go in a very different direction here. And this is so important for us to see. Because if we came here... If you clicked on this link, sorry for the clickbait, and you're asking the question, how can I divorce my wife and still be okay with God? You are asking the wrong question. And this goes for so much of the Christian life. We have to think, so how much can I get away with and still go to heaven? This was the question the youth group often in dating. Be like, how far can I get away with and still be okay with God? But that's a terrible question. That is like going to your doctor and asking them, how much poison exactly can I eat before I die? And then just go take a little bit of poison. It's a bad question. Don't eat any of the poison. Instead, eat something good, like a, like a donut. It's good. Or a hamburger. 
or I'm supposed to say, an A&W team burger. <laughs> the question to ask here first is not, what is a legitimate reason to divorce one's wife? The question to ask is, what is marriage and how do I glorify God best in the marriage that I'm in or the marriage I hope to be in? Jesus says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh what therefore God has joined together let not man separate first a side note that doesn't have anything to do with divorce and that's this thing that comes along and that People say, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality, and that's kind of true. He didn't say any negative prohibitions. But he did say marriage is between one man and one woman for life. That is defining what that relationship is, and by extension excludes other kinds of relationships that people might dream up. And they're always, you know, you know, sin is, is confusing because, you know, they're always inventing new ways to sin. But the way of following God is rather simple. One man, one woman, one flesh for life. Marriage is a solemn covenant that joins two people for as long as they both show it. So Jesus quotes Genesis at the beginning. They are no longer two, but one... He, they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then Jesus makes his own comment. Well, that's his own comment. They, they become one flesh. His comment is, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And so if this is true, if God has created marriage in such a way that two people are bound to each other, we should not separate them. It's interesting that vows are so key to a marriage. So you get up and, and you say vows. First you say like to the minister, which is really to God. It's like, I promise to have this woman and they the same. They turn, you make the vows to each other. And that's all very intentional because these vows are to God and to each other. And making vows is so core to how we naturally love. We we'll say that marriage is built into our DNA because when you fall in love with someone, the first thing you want to do is make grandiose promises that you probably could never even keep. You listen to the meatloaf song, Paradise Beneath the Dashboard Lights. I'll love you till the end of time. Maybe more beautifully, you get the, the, the greatest... 90s country love song shout out to 90s country music don't listen country music died in like 2002 randy travis i'm gonna love you forever forever and ever amen as long as old men sit and talk about the weather as long as old women sit and talk about old men. Yeah, yeah, you like it. You know, so, and this is like, we make vows, and we make the kind of vows that are like, I am going to love you for as long as I live, as long as people are cracking jokes in old folk songs. I will love you. And that's the kind of thing love does. What Christian marriage does is give teeth to the promise. It's like you're up there, you're making that promise, not just, you know, paradise beneath the dashboard lights. You're making that promise before God and everybody saying that not only am I making this promise, I am holding myself to it. And the fact is, there's a problem with so many people just sort of cohabitate and they have relationships with no real definition is that they accept the promise 
It was like, hey, put this promise on the, on the altar before God. Make it mean something. Real love says, I'm going to love you forever. Makes those vows before God. Makes your words not to be cheap things. It binds your words as tightly as... Has anyone ever put like a three-inch screw into some really hard wood? Yeah. You know, I put that screw into there with a Phillips head. And then try to take that screw out of there. Like, like that is what the marriage vows are. And maybe possibility you might get that thing out, but it ain't never going to be the same. The Pharisees want to say, hey, how exactly can I get divorced? And Jesus immediately said, you're asking the wrong question. Look at God's design for marriage. One man, one woman, bound as tightly as a three-inch screw into a piece of wood. Marriage isn't Velcro shoes. On and off without much pain. Now, there are all sorts of different things they do at weddings. And some of them I approve of. Some of them are wastes of time. Now, one of the wastes of time, but it's cool, is the, the sand thing. Sorry, people do the sand thing. If you're going to do one of those things, I get an extra five minutes of my sermon. That's the rule. <laughs> so the sand, but they take those sand and they like pour them together. And like, this is a great picture of how indissolvable marriage is. It's just like, okay, you want to break this thing apart? Start taking those grains of sand apart. The two have become one flesh. And we make the promise before God because one day you will feel like breaking it. If you didn't, there'd be no like real like good reason if people just always stayed married. They make that vow before God because on the day when you're ready to throw in the towel, you still have that promise and God is going to hold you to it. Remember your vows. Don't make yourself a liar before God. What God has joined together, let not man separate. The joining is ultimately not. What God has joined together, let not man separate. The joining is, on, is not a man-made union to be flipped on and off, but something God has done. Now, the Pharisees, being Pharisees, you know, want to get off on technicalities. It's interesting. The Pharisees always portray as really harsh, but here they are, you know, trying to, like, get some space for themselves. So often people who are really harsh in one area have a lot of license in the other area, usually for themselves, and a lot of rules for other people. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Now, we looked at that last week. And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And we saw in the sermon last week about how the king's coming, Jesus Christ coming, has made it so people have a new heart, so there's no longer allowances for hardness of heart. So God and G Jesus Christ calls us to following the moral law with complete uprightness. And so, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, as the old vows said. Then Jesus says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now this is really interesting, because up until this point, we've been moving towards Jesus, not saying the middle line, except for sexual immorality because Jesus has been teaching the whole time look at 
the design for marriage. One man, one woman, for life. Why now introduce this kind of exception? He kind of moving towards that. I mean, in Luke, there was no exception. We can read it. Let's read it in Mark. Mark. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. In Mark here, no exception. Luke, no exception. Why in Matthew does he have this exception clause? And I think the reason is that Jesus in teaching, in showing us what is the goal, does not want us to keep our eyes off the goal. He doesn't want us to, to take our eyes off of the goal, which is one man, one woman for life. And as soon as you start getting the details like this and that, you start thinking all on the wrong path. And so even as we, we, we start to talk about what grounds are legitimate grounds for divorce, we do so with great trepidation because Jesus' movement is all pointing us, remember the purpose, remember God's design. So even as we have these three words in Greek of exception, we must remember God's design, one man, one woman for life. And yet there is an exception. And I think it's for this reason, and that's while Jesus Christ calls us to live purely, he calls every Christian who has a new heart to uphold the moral law and all that we do. That does not guarantee that you will be not married, that you will be not married to someone who does have a hard heart, who does, is not reborn, who is not able to follow God's highest call, and thereby does something so terrible that it breaks the marriage bond. So I think there are three exceptions to God's design for marriage. Now remember, we only look at these like we are looking at God's design and we're just going to take just a peripheral glance at possibilities, just peripheral. Just looking off the side, all right? One, false vows. So I am always very, I, I take church history very seriously because I figure like I am not the first Christian to figure something out. And so if there's legitimate grounds for divorce, there better be a historical precedent that goes past 25 years ago because I wanna see a different culture deal with this. And the first case I find legitimate divorces in the Puritans. So the Puritans, shining city in the hill, they started colonies in America, and one of these was the Mass Massachusetts, I always said it wrong, Bay Colony. And there was a man there named James Luxford who was married to a woman named Elizabeth Luxford. They had one child, she was pregnant with the second child. And all of a sudden, she discovered that her husband was already married to another woman back in England. Okay, so she went, she took a vows with this guy, but he didn't have a heart to it. He was already married to someone else. And so legally, a marriage like that just isn't valid. Now that doesn't happen so much in the days of, now in the days of Wikipedia, but there are cases where people present themselves very falsely and you get married quickly, don't do that. Come to your pastor, do counseling. Where something like an annulment might be given. Now, it's very interesting. So the Puritans here, and they're often seen as kind of anti-women. And so what, what they did, she was like, she went like, my husband's already married. And so the courts, they took all of James Lutzford's property and they gave it to the woman. They put him in stocks for an hour in the town square for people to gawk at. They fined him a hundred pounds. 
I'm not sure how he paid it because all his property was now his wife's. And they kicked him out of the colony. I'd sort of like to live in a place that cared for people that well. Exception two, adultery. I say to you, ever, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Now, the second exception that you may seek divorce is sexual unfaithfulness. Now, sexual immorality here refers to sex outside of the marriage bond. And that might be adultery, that might be uh, undisclosed premarital sexual affairs, something like that, which was a big deal back in the day. People don't think about that so much now. This means that one, if their spouse had an affair, would have a right to seek a divorce. It doesn't mean that you have to get divorced. I actually know oh, more than one couple who have gone through infidelity, gone through counseling, and had long, amazing marriages. And if that's your situation, I would say, like, you know, try to seek union first. But don't use this as a first. Keep your eyes fixed on the goal. Well, man, one woman for life. Now there are necessary outs when dealing with hard hearts, but it's not a first case. One would probably ask why is sexual unfaithfulness so bad here? Like, why does Jesus point this one thing out? And the reason why is that sex is such an important thing in marriage. It is the literal symbol of two becoming one flesh. Sorry, kids, just forget all that. So that if you use it with another person, it breaks the sacred covenant bond. We cannot treat, we cannot treat sexual union as a light thing. It is, hey wait, a covenant ceremony that says to the other, I am completely and unreservedly yours. My flesh is your flesh. Yours is mine. We are one together. Breaking that bond is very serious. And Jesus says it can have the most serious of consequences for marriage. It's also a reason why sex before marriage is so damaging because it's using God's purpose for something less than it was designed for, saying I'm completely and totally yours forever, saying that you are my spouse, you're married. The third exception, and this is controversial, uh, and I could spend a lot more time in 1 Corinthians, and if you want to talk to me about it, especially if you're thinking of something like this, you probably should, because there is significant disagreement on the interpretation of this text. Uh, I read it as such that the first part of the text in 7, 11, and 12 is that if you are a Christian and you initiate separating from your spouse, you are not permitted to remarry. But if, and this is, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So that if you're married to someone and they just take off. I know cases of this happening too. Man, I know so many awful things. Yeah, I mean, you guys probably do too. In such a case, as a Christian, again, divorce not the first option. You seek reconciliation. Take building bridges like, hey, what did I do? Because, hey, usually you do something. I'm going to say there are legitimate grounds for divorce, but there's never sinless divorce. There's always two sinners who are married. You always have something to repent of, even if you don't have as much to repent of. This 
I will note that the Handbook for Church Discipline of the Alliance Church, sorry if anybody is watching this, uh, does not list abandonment as a legitimate qualification for divorce, and some others disagree. And yet, documents as old as the Westminster Confession of Faith, which over 300 years old, does list abandonment as, well, willful abandonment as grounds for divorce. If you're lost at sea, that doesn't quite count. So you don't want Tom Hanks' situation happening. The Westminster Confession says this, such willful desertion as can in no way be remedied by the church or civil magistrate, but back then they would just have the cops come and haul you back to your wife or something, <laughs> is sufficient cause of dissolving the bond of marriage. Paul, I think, is directly building up the teaching of Jesus here. If you leave your spouse, you cannot rightly be remarried, if you commit adultery against your spouse, you cannot rightly be remarried. But if these things are done against you, you can divorce and remarry. And as the Westminster Confession of Faith says, you can remarry as if your former partner is dead. It's literally the words they use, that they are dead. Now, again, I want to remark that we only want to take a sidelong glance at these things because our aim in Christian marriage today is to fulfill God's design of one man, one woman, as long as we both shall live. Don't be looking for an out. Now, I realize in some cases when you're dealing with messy situations of divorce, like it's unclear if you have biblical merit to divorce. Like, man, there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff being said. In such times, or, you know, you did a bunch of stuff before you were a Christian. In such times, I think, one, you should be patient. Like, don't run into another marriage after you, you know, had a messy divorce, got saved. Just breathe for a bit. Like, you can live as single for a while. But in that, you want to be working with friends, elders, and your pastor to walk forward in a holy way as you can. Finding, living in grace, because there's always grace, especially for when we did things when we were ignorant and without Christ. Now, I listed three probable reasons, and there's one that I didn't list, and it's also controversial and we also have to talk about it. And that is, what about abuse? Now, what if your husband's beating you? Can you get a divorce? I take this really seriously because if you are a woman, the most likely person to kill you is your intimate partner. Just in the news last week. Murder, suicide. Happens all the time. And as a church, we want to take these things very seriously because we are here to protect the weak, to lift up the poor like Jesus Christ came to do. Now, if you're in a marriage where things are difficult, you know, usually things don't start out with people shooting at each other. Your one is you need to be talking to good Christian counsel, good friends, your small group, about what's going on. Don't keep the veil of secrecy. Believe me, you know, it, it gets hard to define abuse sometimes because you, like, you go down the list of everything you've done. It's basically everyone at one moment in their lives could be thrown in jail for something they may have done on technical grounds. This is why we need to be talking for so you're lifting the veils because everybody has difficulty. Marriage isn't easy. Two sinners making a vow before God. Second, if there are continued issues, bring it to church leadership. You know, I would be, you know, there's like a problem, you know, you don't want to involve the police, so say, hey, you know, 
husband, you have to get counseling. You have to get it now or else there's going to be consequences. Or it's going to be like, husband, you need to move out. I'm only saying husband here because, you know, it's 99% that way. Husband, you need to move out. And if he's like, no, I don't want that, that's when we pick up the phone. We say, police, like, we're going to press charges. Your Christian wife, you can press charges for your husband if he's breaking the law in his actions towards you. Totally legitimate. And I, as a pastor, like, I will support you in that very difficult thing. Now, probably you don't want to do that first. Also had situations where people called the cops and kind of regretted it later because it made things much more difficult, but totally have that right. And in that case, husband gets arrested. Husband said, you got to go to counseling. And the husband's like, no, I'm not going to do this. You're still my wife. You need to do this. In that case, he's not doing all that he needs to do to be married, I think. That's the same thing as willful abandonment. He is abandoning her to his pride. And in such a case, I think the wife may divorce as willful abandonment. And it's always kind of a train wreck and a tragedy, but we're all just living in the grace of God. In everything, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and his plan for marriage. Because we need to be working together at this. As two sinners who have every opportunity to go astray, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ day by day to get through this, to bring glory to his name. So we're not having to go have those hard conversations. We're able to bless others in the union as God created. Before you get within five miles of divorce, to be working, putting the work in. Husband, wives, don't get distracted. Go into your hobbies. Keep working at your marriage. Jesus' teaching is keep your eyes focused on the prize. One man, one woman for life. This is God's will for you. Now, there is a lot of allowances if hard hearts intervene, but that's not God's best way. So let's pray and let's look to God to follow his will for marriage. Lord God, I pray that you would keep our eyes focused on you, that we would see your ideal for marriage and we would follow it with our whole hearts. At the same time, let us give grace to those who have been broken by the sin of others and lift them up and encourage them in the Lord Jesus Christ as brothers and 